Sirs and madams, Halloween is right around the corner, which brings with it certain obligations. I, as a YouTuber, am basically doomed to play some kind of horror game. Which is good, I love a good scary game, but, uh... Pokemon X and Y just came out, and, uh... Well... Oh man, do I love me some Pokemon! Seriously, ever since Red and Blue, I have been all about the Pokemans. Everyone was. Everyone in my school played the games, watched the show, collected the cards. Hell, we got so into it, we even set up our own gym system. People could be appointed gym leaders. We would make our own badges, and kids from all around the school could challenge us and stuff. It was so freaking cool! But it was also kind of stupid, because everyone just used the Missingno cheat to get like a million rare candies, so everyone pretty much just had a team of six level 100 whatevers. It wasn't very well thought out, but it was fun while it lasted, and ever since those golden days of yesteryear, I've always looked forward to the next Pokémon release. And even if it's not at the forefront of the public's attention anymore, the Pokémon series has continued to be a source of excitement and comfort for me. So, yeah. Got the new one right here. I was seriously tempted to do a Pokémon video just so I could get to this baby faster, but, uh, when I realized just how many people were gonna be doing Pokémon videos, and that I don't have a 3DS capture card, I figured a horror game was the better way to go. So, I will leave this here for now, and go find something scary to play. As I've said before, I loves me some survival horror, and I'm very excited by all of the love they've been getting on online distribution services lately. Games like Don't Starve, Outlast, and Machine for Pigs are all the rage these days, but I, sirs and madams, was just as excited for another intriguing looking title that appeared on GOG.com not too long ago. The trailer for Montague's Mount boasted complex puzzles, a deep and emotional story, and atmosphere out the wazoo. And if there's one thing I like more than puzzles and story, it's atmosphere filled wazoos. Don't picture that. It leads to some terrible places. The game begins with our protagonist finding himself on the shore of an island knowing next to nothing. Sounds a lot like the opening to another first-person perspective puzzle game, a particular favorite of mine. This seems less than coincidental, as the premises of both of these games seem to be cut from more or less the same cloth. There is an island, with a lot of mystery and intrigue strewn across it, and it's up to you to figure out the puzzles and discover what the deal is. While Mist is mysterious because of how unique and otherworldly it is, this game dives headfirst into the realm of tragedy and loss. Everything on the island is a ruined shell of its former self, and it isn't long before you discover the fate of many of the island's inhabitants. The narrator makes it clear that there was an unnamed plague that swept across the island, and eventually recalls that the people had to decide to either leave or stay and risk death. And when it becomes apparent that our amnesiac protagonist's wife, daughter, and son were residents on the island, the search to discover their fate begins. The player is then tasked with combing the rainy, sloping coasts of Montague's Mount, which is either the name of the island itself or the mountain in the middle, I'm not entirely sure. If I have to pick one thing this game nailed, it's the environment. The graphics in this game are par for the course as far as PC games go nowadays, but where this game really shines is making you believe the miserable rainy weather. Everything from the sound design to the way the rain cycles dynamically through various stages of a rainy night fits together beautifully and really sells the feeling of this game. I also thought that the aesthetic detail of the game was wonderfully put together. Very little is out of place in this crumbling, overgrown village, and little concepts like the SOS light in the distance was a nice, bone-chilling touch. The sound design over Overall is fantastic. The gritty grind of objects against stone, the creaking of doors, but what really impressed me was the way the music cues were built into the actions of gameplay. Picking up an important item will bring about new parts or transitions in the music as a way of informing you that you're ready to move on. The puzzles are also great. There aren't many of them as it's a short game, but the ones that are there really got my brain working, and reminded me very strongly of Mist in many ways. There isn't much handholding here, and at times they can be a bit vague as in vaguer than they probably should have been. The puzzle that got me the hardest was the compass directions puzzle, as I didn't know if I was supposed to match them to the diagram they give you, or figure out a new one, or whether or not I was supposed to align the directions to where I'm facing, or the marker on the compass. It was a bit confusing. They were kind enough to include a compass mechanic, which I didn't discover until way into being stuck on this puzzle, and to be honest, seems like it was included specifically for this puzzle. At times, I actually found I had to write down clues or notes for myself, something that I haven't had to do in years, probably since Mist. But unfortunately, it was mostly so that I wouldn't have to make the trek back to look over them again. 
It is here that the flaws of the game really start to shine through. The walk speed at which you move through the game is painfully slow at times. It makes sense inside of the game, as your character is injured and the first thing you do is look for a walking stick. But when the clues for these sometimes surprisingly complex puzzles are spaced this far apart, the walking speed of your character becomes a very visible and important factor to think about. In my ample time walking back and forth across the island, the myriad of graphical glitches made themselves abundantly clear. It was hard to walk anywhere without seeing objects and shadows spawn right in front of your eyes. I opened up the graphics options to try and increase the load distances, or really anything, because my graphics card ain't fooling around, yo! But it made no difference. It also seems like this game suffers from a distinct lack of playtesting. At one point in the game, I was carrying on climbing over fences and the like, only to become horrendously stuck exactly the kind of stuff you might expect in a puzzle game like this. After wandering around, running into walls, and clicking on everything putt-putt style for way too long, I finally called it a day and went to bed. When I booted up the game the next day, I found major changes to the environment, as in, I could leave now. That gate certainly wasn't open yesterday, clearly part of the solution to a puzzle I didn't even realize I was supposed to solve on account of the layout of the surrounding area. Why was that plank of wood there if it was only going to drop me out of the sequence of events? Because of that event, I was stuck playing the rest of the game with a glitched item in my inventory that I couldn't even get rid of, meaning I was only allowed to carry four items instead of five. Fortunately, there were no puzzles that required me to hold five items at once, but none of that matters because pretty soon I made it over the geometry borders and went for a walk in the ocean. I will have you know, I was not trying to break the game. If it's this easy, the game wanted to be broken. All I must do is extend my hand to touch you. And yet, you are so far from my reach. For a game that bills itself using the word horror in any capacity, really, there is nothing that lives up to that descriptor. After the first time you see a ghostly vision of your children playing, there's nothing here that I would describe as particularly scary. Honestly, I can't say I ever felt scared, or even uneasy during this game. The first time I found a dead body, I was a little taken aback. A few more here and there would have been acceptable, but after a while, there are pretty much only dead bodies all over the damn place. And there are no distinguishing features. They all look like ragdoll mannequins put there for... I don't know, it just wound up looking stupid. I get that the whole ordeal is supposed to make you feel uneasy. The weather, the surroundings, the isolation. It works, and certainly kept me on edge for about 10 minutes. After I had acclimatized to what the game had to offer, it stopped affecting me because I pretty much knew what to expect wherever I went. Something that's really not that hard to fix. Example, Resident Evil Remake for the GameCube, the game I consider to be the high watermark for atmospheric design. This game solved the problem beautifully through use of the typewriter rooms. When you enter a typewriter room, the music changes noticeably into a soothing melancholic piano piece, and there are never any enemies for you to worry about. Everything about these rooms, even if they may not look very comfortable, puts your mind at ease and allows you to mentally catch your breath, as it were. When you venture back out into the big scary mansion, it's that much more effective because you've just been relaxing and reminding yourself of the extremes. This is especially effective because we know that the atmosphere is building up to something, namely monster attacks. In Montague's Mount, it's all this, all the time. No breaks, and it doesn't build to anything. Even something as simple as allowing us to close a door, mute the sound of the pounding rain for even a few minutes at a time would be a huge step in the right direction. As it is, by the end of this game, the environment was almost totally lost on me. A constant barrage of misery dooms this game to an almost certain death sentence all horror games need to avoid. Letting the player get used to it. Perhaps if the quote-unquote scares were a bit more substantial, we could have foreboding to carry us through, but I really didn't get much of anything from these. If they're not scary, then are they supposed to be emotional? They didn't really succeed at either, and they don't contain or convey any story relevance. They don't even really give any hints as to what the puzzles expect from you. I mean, yes, I understand I'm supposed to go in there, it's literally the only place for me to go. Each time this little guy showed up in the game, my eyebrows just went higher and higher, as each time I failed to come up with a reason for why he was there in the first place. And they finally hit the ceiling on our last encounter when, apparently, he was trying to find a contact lens on the beach. I mean, I couldn't think of why he would be... it... it like... I... I don't know, it's... <laughs> The closer you get to him, the more he fades away, until he's supposed to just up and disappear. 
but if you let him keep going, man, he really wants that contact lens. Even rock formations won't stop this determined little guy. Keep on trucking, little buddy. You can do it. Now, I'm not going to spoil any of the story for two reasons. Number one, it's based on a true story, which normally is the first excuse we, the audience, have to immediately assume it's greatly exaggerated and skewed to try and tell a better story. But regardless, it does deal in some pretty heavy shit, which I don't really want to make light of in this case. The second reason is, well, the damn thing isn't finished yet. The game comes to a screeching halt after resolving very little, and then claims to be continued in something called Liberation. This pissed me off, and I'm not afraid to say it, because nowhere on GOG.com or the game's Steam Greenlight page, which has already succeeded so it's not like anything I'm gonna say who's gonna change anything, are we told or is it even implied that this game is a first chapter or a part one of something? This quote-unquote ending comes after just five hours of gameplay, and I was stuck on that one compass puzzle for like an hour, and my vacation to Out of Sequenceville took up about 40 minutes. All things considered, this is only really a three-hour game, and really, if we're gonna be generous here, gives us four major puzzles to work through. These revelations, coupled with the glitches and other shortcomings throughout this game, not to mention not even sort of living up to the story the green light materials promised, make for a really unfortunate experience at the going rate of $10. I feel it's pertinent to mention, however, that Polypusher Studios is effectively a one-man development team. This, in my mind, sheds a bit of a different light on the whole debacle. What is here is a remarkable piece of work for a one-man team. There was, however, a publisher involved, and a lot of names floating around the credits, so take that as you will. There is a truckload of potential here, but it all just ends up becoming the biggest proof that a game of this scope and caliber deserves a larger team. I really wanted to like this game, I really did. I love puzzling adventures and I love scary games, but really, the only conclusion I can come to is that I should have played Outlast. Or Machine for Pigs. Or, you know, Pokemon! Okay, so while I go play some much needed Pokemon, feel free to check out some of my older videos. Make sure to subscribe if you want to know when new videos go up. It might be a while. There's also a Twitter account and a Facebook page with my name on it for when you want to witness the epic chaos that is me making a video. See you next time.